All right. We're going to power through these couple days here. <clears throat> We're not going to hang our head on anything too much that these guys say. Um, I have found in these last few weeks that it is much more important. <laughs> it is much more engaging and thrilling, whatever, to uh, watch the Department of State than uh, the U.S. Department of State more than this. So we'll watch Ned Price a little bit more tonight. Um, let's get through her. Let's start out. Do 2705. Let's get right to it, huh? All right, hold on. Before we do this, uh, those questions go to, to my colleagues in the White House Counsel's Office. Good All right. Let's get this clippable so I can put some stuff on YouTube and promote us with the, the tubes of the Ube, the Ube tubes. All right. Stony Progressive, Washington, D.C. debunking takedown discussion. Let's go over the White House press briefing. Let's go over the Department of Security's press briefing with Ned Turner, Kareen. We're going to do them both. Here we go. Stony Progressive, let's do this. Uh, another question on the documents. Um, you have said, though, from this podium many, many times over the last two weeks that this president takes the handling of classified material very seriously. And yet we continue to learn about more documents being found and discovered at his home, including now some that go back decades to his time in the Senate. So why should the American people believe that this president takes classified material seriously and the handling of it? Look, the president, the American people heard from the... Oh, that was great. <laughs> oh, senile man's losing documents president directly on this when he was asked by your colleagues at least twice now about um about how he sees good evening viceroy how's it going how's it going this process and he was very clear with, with, with the response of what we're currently seeing and he says i take this very seriously he said i didn't know uh, that the documents were there um and look i think as it relates to the american people oh. and the president standing with the american people uh, it is going to be uh, up to them to decide uh, how they see uh, this president look this is a president that came into office nine million people had lost their jobs make your own decision we're not going to have any we're not going to actually say that he's a good guy or a bad guy we're just saying make your own decisions make your own decisions it's okay if you don't like them it's fine the unemployment rate was 6.3% and hundreds of thousands of small businesses had closed their doors. And in the past two years, we've created nearly 11 million jobs. The unemployment rate is at a record low at 50, uh, 50 year uh, record low. In the last two years were the best years for small business applications on record. We talked about that last week, just from here. Uh, the president has built the most significant legislative record uh, since LBJ. Let's not forget, there's a Chips and Science Act, the bipartisan infrastructure legislation. I just walked through what he's going to see next week uh, when he's traveling uh, to Baltimore and also New York City, the Inflation Reduction Act. Act, which is going to deal with lowering costs. So the president has been in office for the last two years focusing on the American people. Uh, and, you know, we saw that. We saw what the American people had to say during the midterms. As it relates, again, as it... Hanging your head on an election that we were scared into. Hanging your head on an election that people were absolutely pushed into. And you're going to quote that shit. <laughs> Oh, uh, given Biden's mental ability, he probably was truthful that he did not know. Oh, I mean, pff, yeah, shit's going to be slipping, man. The old man's out of it. Relates to this, as it relates to this ongoing legal matter, I would refer you to, to my colleagues at the White House Council. Again, they're going to be speaking with all of you in just, in, in just you know, less than an hour or so. But I, I just want to ask one more time, because you have been the one messaging that he takes this. They're gonna, so this was uh, rang through in this whole press briefing, like, they're going to be talking to you soon. They're going to be talking to you soon. You're going to talk to them in an hour. You guys can all ask them questions in an hour. You can ask them questions. I am not answering anything. Ugh. You have also been saying over and over again that you are cooperating fully with this investigation. That, that hasn't changed, Mary. But given that, why then did... That hasn't changed, bitch. We've been cooperating. We've been cooperating all the way. I'm just not going to answer any of your questions. We've been cooperating all the way, bitch. Shit hasn't changed, Mary. It takes several searches and the FBI coming in to uncover the full extent of the documents. That I understand your question. I've, I've said many times, the president has said many times, he takes this very seriously. You've heard directly from him. You just said that his team is cooperating fully. And just want to add, you know, and you heard from his team, that 
the FBI was invited into uh, the president's home. I'm not going to go beyond that. That, is, that was in the statement that was released on Saturday. Again, these are questions uh, that, should, that have been answered to our, you know, that have been answered from here, that has been answered for my colleagues. Anything else, my colleagues are, my colleague is going to speak to all of you in just a few minutes, a few moments, and uh, you can ask more, more yeah, intel, in detail. One thing you, just said. you just said the president said that he did not know the documents were there. I'm not actually sure he has said that, that clearly. Are you saying the president did well, not Well, he said he was surprised. He said he was surprised. He said he was surprised. I'm just going to be there, and I'm going to refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. He, I'm just repeating what he said, and he said... You just said you I'm repeating what he said. That's exactly what Sean Spicer always used to say. I'm just repeating what you said. I'm repeating your words. It's the vernacular that you use, so I'm using your words. Oh, man. She she just pulled off of Sean Spicy. And, yeah, she always refers to somebody else. She literally... Um, we're going to do this super fast because she did not say much this week. Because she always is just Department of State, Department of Defense, um, the lawyer team, the lawyer team, the lawyer team, Department of Defense, the lawyer team... Um, talk to securities, talk to this, talk to that. Like, that's all she did. That's all she did. It was so bad all week. I watched like five hours of this lady this week. <laughs> More classified materials in Wilmington. Which four letter word did you use? <laughs> oh, so he asked when you, when you, uh, we gotta do this whole thing. All right, hold on. Thank you, Green. When you found out that the FBI had located even more classified materials in Wilmington, which four letter word did you use? <laughs> Oh, seriously? <laughs> oh my goodness, Peter. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, president Biden is still intending to run for re-election in 2024, right? Uh, I'll just repeat what the president said after the midterm election, which is he intends to run. I'm going to be very careful from here, as you know, uh, because we are covered by the Hatch Act, and I'm not going to speak further to his process. Is there a precedent for people running for president after FBI agents search their sock drawer? Say that one more time. Say that beginning is, part. Is there a precedent for people running for president after FBI It sounds like you. It sounds like you already know that, that the answer to that question. Look, here's what I. I don't here's, know the answer to no, that question. Here's, here's, An here's, FBI search of a president's residence is a big, big deal. Here's what the president's going to focus on. He's going to focus on continuing to deliver for the American people. That's his focus. That's what he focuses on every day. That's what he's been focusing on the last two years, and nothing is going to change that. You think about the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, you think about the Inflation Reduction Act, you think about the Chips and Science Act, bipart those, the bipartisan one, the last two that I mentioned, done in a bipartisan way, that's what the... Those bipart the bipartisan ones, the ones that are bipartisan, that's what the president wants to do. That's what the president's talking about doing. He's not talking about documents, he's talking about changing the country. Ah, oh, yeah president wants to do. He wants to continue to deliver on his economic plan that is going to build the economy from the bottom up, middle out. And that is what... Oh, I hate is. that. I hate that phrase. She says that so much. I hate that phrase. The House Oversight Committee chairman says this document situation has all the makings of a potential cover-up. Is President Biden involved in a cover-up? We've been very... <laughs> that was uncomfortable. Very clear here from this administration. The president has been very clear that um, he takes this very seriously when it comes to the, when it comes to classified information, when it comes to classified documents, and that his team has been um, has been fully cooperative uh, with this legal matter. Anything else, Peter? And this is and I'm, I'm going to be very serious. You asked me kind of a question that everybody laughed at, which was interesting question to ask. But the way she even does that, she's just so snappy. Any other uh, any other underlying questions that you may have, I would refer you to my colleagues, the White. That's her thing. I'll refer you to my colleagues. And that's what she says this whole press briefing, the whole next day, the whole day after that. Um, but let's do a little side note on the documents. Um, I want to do a lot of side notes today. Break this up a bit. <clears throat> All right, so this is our first side note, and then we'll jam through some more shit. But the first side note Should I had this morning when is Chris Hedges on classified documents used for distraction. The classified documents is just distraction. And they talk about it like all the time. It's like all Main Street media wants to talk about. I was watching, I think it was MSNBC. I like to see like, what, what, are, what, are they, what are they trying to feed me today? Well, there's always some big distraction, right? And, right. you know, like when uh, Jelaine Maxwell was moved to a minimum security prison over the summer, there was, nobody was talking about it. There was always some big distraction. So. I was like, okay, so the big distraction is this, the documents. And since some Democrats are even being critical of Biden, I'm like, ah, what is this about? Because like you say, every president does this. 
So whenever they call a president gets called out for doing something that every president has done, I am always like, this is some type of distraction or they want to get rid of this person for some other reason. And I'm just like, to me, I could be wrong, but this is where I'm like, oh, this is where they're starting to ramp up to. And I think what's going to come out next is, oh, Joe Biden's having memory issues. This thing that's been obvious since 2019, when he first started running, um, I feel like this is going to be used as some sort of like, oh, he's not competent. And then here's Kamala Harris. She'll be in and vice president, formal naval, naval intelligence officer, Pete Buttigieg, because I think that's the CIA's final, just ultimate goal is to have a CIA president, like have someone that was trained and sit. What's up, E. Wade? Welcome in. <clears throat> Obviously, seeing you around a lot of chats. Welcome to, to our late show. And yeah, I can't even, I can't watch that. Um, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to watch that right now. I try to go over protests and shit on Mondays and it takes everything out of me to go over that. That's fucking, yeah. Sitting in the Oval Office. Um, so I don't know, how do you see, how do you see this? Because whenever the media is making a big kerfuffle about something, either something's going on behind the scenes, some awful laws being passed, or it's to get everybody distracting and fighting over this so that we're not so, paying uh, Let me just speak as a former New York Times reporter. I spent 15 years at the New York Times. It's, there isn't, so I would write stories and then people would speculate. And sometimes there was stuff behind the scenes, but sometimes there wasn't. Um, so, yeah, they will clearly determine his electability. Uh, I think it's a, probably a little too early for that. Um, and, and if they feel that he's going to get swamped, I wouldn't be surprised if they pressure him out. Um, but I, I, I think it's too early. I, 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 I don't think they know yet. Man, he talks um, slow. You know, part of it is they're not sure who he would run against. I mean, he's kind of, de isn't he kind of dead even with Trump? Um, I mean, Trump's numbers have been falling a bit. Um, but if there was a matchup, for instance, with him and DeSantis, and it looked like a landslide that he was going to get, and this is, of course, what happened with LBJ, yeah, that the party would, would, would push him out. They don't care whether he's sentient or all that. It's irrelevant because the end of the Reagan administration, Reagan didn't even know where he was. I, I, <laughs> talked, I was in Central America at the time and Congress delegations would come down and I talked to one delegation where before they had come to El Salvador, Nicaragua, they'd oh, gone in to meet with Reagan it. in the Oval Office and they, his aides gave him flashcards so he could find the right answer and they'd given him the wrong flashcards. So they asked about Central America and they gave him the economic flashcards and he just read the economic flashcards. Oh man, that's what Biden's going to be doing soon too. It's sad, but that's absolutely... Uh, that's kind of where Biden is headed pretty soon. Yeah, uh, but they don't care. I mean, they, that 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 doesn't matter. The matter, the only question is uh, if we might get pushed out of power. And mm -hmm. I don't think we can tell. I don't think they know yet. Yeah, because it's clear DeSantos is, is is he wants to be the Republican nominee. He's yeah. probably leaked that. And Trump so does had... Mike Pence, that man of courage and great Democrat. That, uh, <laughs> maybe he can run with Liz Cheney. The Democrats all like Liz Cheney. Robert Wright <laughs> wants Liz Cheney to run for president. That kind of shows you what's happened to liberalism in America. Wow. The woman well, who voted with Trump about 94% of the time or something. It's, well, that's the thing. The, the Republican Party has gone so far to the right. They're just a neo-fascist organization. The Democrats follow them. So now uh, the Democrats today are... Maybe Pete. He seems pretty corporate center. I think Pete Buttigieg would be a pretty good uh, candidate for... He's in the White House, right? He's around there. I don't know. Um, he seems like a corporate tool. He seems like the, the person they want. Maybe it's Kamala. Maybe maybe she looks like a stupid drunk in front of everybody, and then she gets in the back pages, and she's really uh, she's really smart and destroying shit. I don't know. These elites would rather destroy the planet as a whole than allow capitalism to be destroyed by a revolution. I think they're willing to let it burn. <laughs> I think they're definitely willing to let it burn. Um, <laughs> let it burn and hide out, and then try to come back and rebought you know i don't know they kind of need us though right they kind of need us still all right let's watch the last of the day i think we started at 102 i think da, da, da. let's watch the last this is monday the end of kareen bringing those prices down when it comes to uh, uh health care costs bringing those costs down and that's really going to be our focus okay 
Thank you. When you and the White House and the President all say that the President takes these classified documents very seriously, without commenting on the ongoing legal issue, what would you point us to that would demonstrate that seriousness? I'm going to really refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. I am. I'm going. I am. So the President continues to say he takes this seriously, and you can't demonstrate how he takes it seriously. Let me just finish. Let me finish my answer. I'm going to I'm going to refer you to the White House Counsel's Office, and I'm going to refer you to uh, the statements that you've received uh, from his personal lawyer. Uh, oh. I'm going to refer you to the 45 minutes of conversation of back and forth that my colleague has had with all of you last week. He's about to do another one where you can ask questions about this particular. Uh, yes, the idea of a great reset does involve a lot less people and they're talking. I mean, I've heard 200 million to a, or less. So, yeah. That idea does, does. Legal matter, again, that's where this belongs. That's where I'm gonna refer you to. Uh, but again, you've seen the statements. Uh, you've heard from the president a couple of times. You've heard from his personal lawyer. You've heard from the White House Counsel's Office. And that's where I'm gonna leave it. The has passed bipartisan legislation that would ban the export of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to Chinese companies. Given that oil has flowed to China from that reserve during both this administration and the previous one, is that the type of reform that the president would potentially support? So look, uh, I think this is a little bit of what- Yeah, they got, <laughs> I'll refer you to, I'll refer you to, I'll refer you to. <laughs> Man, like she needs a button. Like that's my catchphrase, yo. She puts it on her shirt. I refer you to. WHC, White House Counsel. Boom, boom. That needs to be your tagline. Like, <laughs> bitch, don't say nothing. But uh, the secretary was talking about just moments ago, this bill uh, addresses a non-issue. We're very clear on that. Uh, we focus, we, we're focused on advancing legislation that would lower costs for American families, not raise them. So I'm just going to leave it there. Okay. Uh, just two quick ones. One, does the pre I know the president has uh, answered a few questions here and there, but is there any plans for the president to come out and sort of address this investigation in a more fulsome way, give more of a detailed timeline? I know you're referring us to the council's office. <laughs> I know you're referring us to the council's office. I know you keep referring us to the council's office. Uh but I'm wondering if we will hear more fully from the president himself on this matter. Look, as you just stated in your question to me, the president has uh, addressed this, uh, spoken to about this a, a couple. That would be a good sound clip, Vice Roy. If I had a really updated computer, which my computer barely does this, so um, if I had an updated computer, when I get a new laptop, that's the kind of shit I would love to do is just have sound clips of her saying one thing in the same shirt. Like, if I can get 20 times of her saying that in that shirt, that's fucking funny of times uh, and uh, I don't have anything to announce right now but he's going to continue again to take questions from all of you as he has done these past several months these two years Ooh, right and, and he's gonna yeah we'll be talking about that real soon oh my god I was watching the freaking that's what it oh shit you wait I was fucking watching the uh, Brianna and Vosh discussion oh my god I want to punch Vosh in his stupid face so badly oh I want to punch Vosh in his stupid face Take those questions as he understands on behalf of the American people, as you guys ask questions and, and uh, do your reporting. Just don't have anything to announce specifically on, on that question. Okay, thanks everybody. See you tomorrow. What up, Nerdski? Welcome in. What's up? What's up? Um, I'll take an edible after I get through the... Uh... <laughs> Jen Saki was better and more entertaining. Um, I like Jen. I like Sean Spicer. I like Jen. Everybody else in between has not been my friend. <laughs> that rhymed a little bit. I think that rhymed a little bit. Okay. Um. <laughs> I refer you to the White House. I love that she ended with the sound clip. Like, she literally ends the day with the sound clip. All right, we're at 124. We're going to be really quick about this day. I promise, I promise, super fast. 136. All right, super fast. Their lives to gun violence. Over the last two decades, more school-age children have died from guns than on-duty police officer and active duty military combined. That was all I had to say about that. What the fuck is that? <laughs> more children have died in school shootings than police and military active duty. That is insane. That is absolutely insane. If that's a true fucking fact, that is absolutely insane.
Yeah. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> so that fact was, I mean, I try not to watch a lot of her, right? Like, I, but that was like, what the hell? If that's a real fact, that's insane. All right. Oh, um, like I said, let's not do a lot of her today. 37, 40. But yeah. Gun is a problem in this country. I'm gonna give you an example. In All right. So she just she was saying how guns are a problem in this country. Um, I think this is a really good segment. Again, we're talking about guns this day because if, I don't know all the fucking shootings. Now we're at four mass shootings in in, in uh, California in like ten days. Like what the hell's going on? Africa. When we see news from the U.S like a six years old boy bringing gun to school and we see people going to the movie theater being killed by gun and also seeing people in this country that have not seen war but are killed by gun is they have not seen war and yet we're getting killed by guns from people in africa are like wait you guys aren't having civil wars and you're getting killed by guns how is that possible extremely scared for us and we have seen that this country is very developed what do you think is preventing the Congress to act when it comes to gun control? And what can more President Biden do to move on and do something to control the gun? And my question comes because I'm a mother. I have two daughters and when they go to school, sometimes I'm afraid that maybe his little bo colleague from school will bring a gun or even in <coughs> random place, we, we get shot. This is very, very scary. And this is a problem. And, and we, we saw recently people also dying by gun. What can President- No, absolutely. Um... America's gun fetish? I think I've seen that. I think we're da, 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 doing some. I think I did something similar to that a couple nights ago. Yeah. Fucking. Oh, yeah. It was literally Tuesday. We did a whole show on guns. If you want to check some segments out, I did a lot. I did like an hour, two hours of straight gun talk. <laughs> Do more to move on and control the guns. And please, what do you think the Congress is waiting to act? So when it relates to the Congress, you have to ask Congress. You have to go over to the con to Congress and meet with uh, congressional members and ask them that very question. Lay it out just the way that you laid it out to me. I think it's an important question for them to answer. Uh, but also, we saw last night Senator Feinstein, along with Senators Murphy and Blumenthal, reintroduce uh, the assault weapons ban, which we support. Uh, and we encourage for Congress to act on that, on that piece of legislation. Look, again, I would... Ref I Oh yeah, she does not answer this question. It's, I feel, so I think this is like the best question I've heard all week, right? Like the the African representative there. I don't, I don't, I didn't hear what African news outlet she she uh, re represents, but that was absolutely the best question all week. Would suggest you go talk to them about this. Look, you just laid out what I just said, right? You just laid nope. out about going to the movie theaters and being worried about gun violence. You just laid out about being a parent and worrying about your child going to school or going to the grocery store and worry about gun violence. That is something that we should not have to deal with. And this is something, again, if you look at the president's record as a senator, you look at his first two years as president, he's dealt with this issue. Uh, and, and he's going to continue to do what he can from here, use the tools of the federal government uh, to take action. He has taken his... We just got to keep trying to rile and rile more people up, e -Wade. We just got to keep trying to enlighten, trying to share it out. Trying to push people who are fucking centrist to be open-minded, and then after they're open-minded, you push them to be revolutionary. Or what well, I was fucking hearing today. Oh, I was hearing, um, you know, there's there's a breaking point. Oh, it was um, it was Lee Camp and Eleanor, their live show this morning, this afternoon, and they're talking about like there's there's a breaking point where more people are upset upset with things staying the same than things changing people are scared of change but once things are so bad that they're scared that they will stay the same then people will start being willing to change i i i thought that was a really good line from their show today historic executive actions as i just laid out moments ago but when it comes to really truly dealing with this issue we need legislation we need legislation. We need Congress to act. So we are thankful and we are hopeful to see uh, what, what occurred uh, with, uh, with this legislation that was introduced again by Senators Feinstein, Blumenthal, and Murphy. And we're going to continue to encourage Congress to act. But I would, I would pose the question that you just asked me uh, to Congress. <laughs> there she goes again. I would go ahead and ask that question to Congress. 
why don't you come here and ask me a question? I'll run around and then tell you to go ask somebody else. How the hell? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> We can still on gun violence. Uh, we have spoke uh, like between me and some friends that uh, in this country, and this I'm, I'm making this point because because we need to remind people that America is the only country on earth that people die by gun without even being on, in war. Because she had to report that out. Like you guys die. With, you're not even at war. You don't even have like civil war, guerrilla wars, or these guerrilla gangs or anything like that. Like Central America and Africa and South America and all these places, you don't have that. I'm giving this example because in Africa there is countries in in war, but people doesn't even have access to gun. It's very hard because the government and everybody is very conscious that the gun can cause a lot of destruction. But in this country, it's very normal for everybody to have access to gun, and this needs to be controlled. But what can people like me, common people, can also what can we do to help control gun? Well, look, uh, what I can speak to, there are many ways that people can get in. Oh, she's not going to fucking say anything. <laughs> she's not going to fucking say anything. Oh. She's not going to fucking say a word. All right. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Just a couple more clips before we move on, guys. So, 12, 12 children a day from gun violence and 30 a day are shot. What's the asterisk for? You try to throw a link in? What the fuck are you doing, dude? Why don't you have an asterisk? You can swear on my fucking chat. What the fuck's an asterisk for? Alright. Yeah, swear away. As you've noticed, I don't censor shit. We do maturity blocks on this shit, so you can swear. Oh, quotes? Oh, sorry. For me, it looks like an asterisk. Because it's very small. That's what she said. Alright. Um, another very quick, like... 50 second, minute and a half, couple little things here. Another um, fact, I believe. I believe this one's just a fact. Oh. ...to armored vehicles. So there's a there's a lot that's being uh, applied to this. Um, and armored vehicles are, are important. You know, you uh, you don't go after a crocodile with a corn stalk. And and these uh, and these vehicles, these tanks, those those uh, armored vehicles, they're they're gonna have they're gonna have an effect. All right, we gotta do that again. Vehicles. So there's a there's a lot that's being uh, applied to this. Um, and armored vehicles are, are important. You know, you uh, you don't go after a crocodile with a corn stalk. And and these uh, and these vehicles, these tanks, those those uh, armored vehicles, they're they're gonna have they're gonna have an effect. You don't go after a crocodile with a corn stalk. I want to beat this guy with a corn stalk. What the hell is that? God, that was stupid. Oh, gotta give some more money to a crane. Hey, we're gonna talk about that pretty soon too, Viceroy. We need to give some more money to a crane. That's coming up. Ah, uh, that's not my notes, but I know it's coming up soon. Maybe in the next segment. Hold on. Let's get to it. 4108. I think you guys are getting ahead of me. I love it when that's the... What happens? Insurance rates that were delivered as part of the American Rescue Plan and were locked in through the Inflation Reduction Act. In all, these lower rates are allowing millions of Americans to continue to save $800 per year on health insurance coverage. President Biden promised to lower costs for families and expand access to quality, affordable health care, and he is delivering on that promise. Bless you, Nancy. And finally, as you all know, tomorrow President Biden will deliver remarks on recent proof that his economic plan is working, including a record nearly 11 million jobs created, the two strongest years of job growth in history, 750,000 manufacturing jobs created, the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years, the best two years for... Because people have stopped looking for work. People have stopped even trying. That's why there's no unemployment because they have tapped out their unemployment for the next decade and now they can't get it. Or they're stopped looking for work and now they can't get it. That's why it's record lows. Small business applications on record, annual inflation falling and wages rising over the last six months. The president will then contrast his plan with Republicans, as you've heard us do many times from here. <clears throat> they did all they could. Man, I don't know. Uh, you know, President Zelensky, he's going around on a, a public speaking tour right now. So they must be doing really well. <laughs> he's going around doing interviews and speaking. I've watched a couple interviews for tomorrow's show. Jesus, he has a boring, weird voice. I do not like that guy. President Z can go back to acting. Hey, we should try to find anybody know of a show that he used to be on that we could watch. <laughs> 
That'd be great. The president is building an, econ an economy from the bottom up and the middle out and protecting Social Security and Medicare. Yeah, he's begging for shit. He's begging for guns and weapons. And he's like, yeah, you guys are giving us 30, but we need 300. I mean, thank you for the 30, but we need 300. What the fuck, dude? Here, congressional Republican Republicans want to cut Social Security, want to cut Medicare programs Americans have earned, have paid into, and impose a 30% national sales tax that will increase taxes on working families. That is what they have said they want to do, and that is clearly their plan. His remarks will be... Ah, yes. Blaming the Republicans. Always the good thing to do on the press, the White House press briefings. <laughs> is blaming Republicans for things. All right, let's move on from this horrible person. Um, bum, bum. So let's talk some actual news, right? So, dun, dun. Um, okay. So we're going to start out right off the bat. Department of Secretary, Department of State, daily press briefings. This is one of the people that she sends her questions to. Not the most recent one. Yeah, no, we send 30. The Russians have thousands upon thousands is uh, what President Z said. They have thousands upon thousands. And you guys, you know, think that that's great and that's great and that's great. But we need, we need 300 to 500 just to sustain. We need 300 to 500 now. We need five, we didn't, well, now. That's the kind of shit he says, so. Good afternoon. Good Happy good Monday. Morning. Good afternoon to everyone. It's uh, quite a full briefing room. <laughs> Joking with my colleague that I have a uh, hard out today at 5 p.m., so. We'll, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I saved it. Yes, this is so great. Oh, this is horrible. Look at that evil face. Look at that evil fucking face. I already have a picture right there, like almost exactly the same moment. And that's going to be my thumbnail for this on YouTube, guys, so. Hello, motherfucker. Hello, motherfucker. What's up? What's up? Yeah, we're going over how we're going to step into WW3 right now. We're going over some of that stuff tonight. <laughs> um, and yeah, we Ned Price is one of the spokesmen for uh, how we're going to get it done. <laughs> Make good use of our time. Uh, just one uh, one announcement at the top, and then we'll turn to your questions. Uh, the United States took further action today, concurrently with the United Kingdom and the European Union, to promote accountability for the Iranian regime's human rights abuses by imposing sanctions on 10 additional Iranian individuals, including Iran's Deputy Minister of Intelligence and, and key commanders in the Iran Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. Oh, seriously, though, that face, man, when he like has like a grin or a grimace or a stare down, oh, his face gets so awkward as well as one additional Iranian entity. Today's action is the latest of <laughs> numerous tranches of sanctions made in close consultation with our allies and partners and aimed at Iranian individuals uh, and entities connected to Iranian authorities' cruel and violent crackdown against peaceful protesters. In addition, we applaud our allies and partners, including the United Kingdom, members of the European Union, Canada, Australia, and others, who also continue to sanction Iranian authorities and entities involved and complicit in human rights abuses and in Iran's supply of weapons to Russia for use in the Kremlin's brutal war against Ukraine. Today, we are united with our allies and partners in the need to confront Iran's leadership for its human rights abuses and stabilizing activities, which should alarm the entire world. With that, turn to your questions. Uh, I was late, so I'll allow... Uh, very magnanimous of you. <laughs> like, every fucking smile that you save it on is such a good evil smile. Uh, sure. I have nothing if not. And nothing? I've, I've always said that about you, Matt. <laughs> Sure. I think people may want to start elsewhere, but can I start in Ethiopia? So that's where we're going to start tonight. Guess what? That's where we're going to go. Um, the, um, um, the withdrawal of the Eritrean troops, there's the, uh, the call um, of the new general from Mr. Abiy. Uh, to what extent is this verified? This is a withdrawal. Um, do you expect it to be permanent? Do you expect it as a new knowledge that it's permanent? Uh, this was a subject of the call with the Prime Minister over the weekend. As you know, they had an opportunity to speak on January 21st. They spoke uh, of numerous elements, but that included the ongoing withdrawal of Eritrean troops from Northern Ethiopia. Uh, the Secretary welcomed this development, uh, noting that it was a key to secure, securing a sustainable peace in Northern Ethiopia, and he urged access for international human rights monitors. Uh, the Secretary also affirmed the commitment of the United States to support the AU-led peace process in Northern Ethiopia. Uh, they also discussed the need to bring an end to ongoing instability in the Oromia uh, region of uh, Ethiopia. Uh, we do applaud the continued steady progress towards 
implementing uh, the key elements of the cessation of hostilities agreement that was reached a number of months ago, uh, as well as the positive role uh, of the AU's joint monitoring, verification, and compliance uh, team. When it comes to Eritrea, as I mentioned before, John, we are aware that Eritrean forces are beginning uh, to withdraw from Ethiopia. Uh, we reiterate the call that you've heard consistently from us, including the call that was included uh, in the communique that emanated from uh, the, the talks in South Africa uh, for the withdrawal of all foreign forces. Um, we uh, reiterate the call, the call for the complete withdrawal in line with that November uh, 12th uh, Nairobi agreement as well. Uh, the departure of Eritrean and other forces is crucial, as I said before, to achieving uh, lasting peace, securing full humanitarian access, and I always love it when he has a written, uh, when they have written, like, I have a response to the question that you asked. I was unaware of this question today. Let me respond to it. <laughs> During the territorial integrity of uh, Ethiopia, even as uh, we continue to see positive signs, including the ongoing withdrawal of uh, Eritrean forces. We are concerned by reports that Eritrean forces have committed human rights abuses against civilians, and we continue to and continue to impede the delivery of much-needed humanitarian assistance. Uh, we call on the governments of Ethiopia and Eritrea uh, to investigate these reports and to hold uh, those responsible to account. You're going to expect people that have been kind of going through a civil border war to do an independent... <laughs> and hold people account, that's not going to happen. Uh, we also call on the government of Ethiopia to fulfill its commitment to grant full access uh, to international human rights monitors. Sure, just follow up a couple of instances. The, the, um, the abuses that you're talking about, you're talking about in the past, not, not for... That's correct, that's, that's correct, control. that's correct. Uh, two things. Have, as far as you know, has there been any contact with the Eritreans? Obviously, the U.S. has a relationship there. And of course, there are sanctions that are on Eritrea um, in the course of the war. Will those, not today, I'm sure, but will those, will those be lifted in some sense? Uh, in terms of our uh, any dialogue with Eritrea, we of course do have an embassy in Asmara. Uh, it is a relationship that um, is, uh, to put it lightly, strained. Uh, <laughs> of course, we have uh, the means by which to convey messages uh, to counterparts in Asmara. Sometimes delivering those message public messages publicly is the most effective means by which to do that, but we do have an embassy there. Um, when it comes to the sanctions that are on Eritrean officials, uh, you are right that there are a number of accountability mechanisms that, uh, some of which uh, were devised and announced in the course of uh, this civil war in Ethiopia that we hope is finally coming to an end. That would be great. Um, not usually real big on, uh, we're not usually the biggest on, you know, getting wars to an end though. That's not really in our wheelhouse, so I'm not sure how that benefits us. One of those was the executive order that this administration devised and uh, President Biden announced uh, some number of months ago. Eritrean forces uh, have been subject to its provisions uh, because of their activity during the course uh, of this conflict. If this continues, uh, if we continue to see uh, positive momentum, we of course will uh, take that into account. We will take into account uh, everything we see, the good, the bad, uh, as we evaluate the happy, the sad, da -da 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 -da. evaluate the next steps and determine uh, whether any additional accountability measures are warranted, or uh, to the contrary, uh, if certain sanctions that are in place uh, no longer have um, a, a basis uh, in that executive order. Uh, Ooh, I have an idea. All sanctions are war, all sanctions are evil, and all sanctions, you fucking prick. How about that? All right. Um, personally, I don't actually know a ton about this. Um, I, you know, I have a lot of side clips for us tonight. And this is a short one because I don't think it's like a huge dive in. I don't think we need to go into like a whole documentary style for this. But I don't know a lot about the Ethiopian conflict. Are you looking for ideas? And I feel guilty by saying that myself, being a news junkie. But you know, we all have our blind spots. And Africa is huge. Africa has a lot going on. <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> And everybody in the stream right now is going to chant that out for me. Go ahead. Go ahead, stream. Anybody that's in the chat, go ahead and tell them. Um, the people that hang out in my, my chat, no. We don't, we don't like Biden, no. Um, we didn't like Trump either. I, I would guess most of us are anti-Trump and anti-Biden. We don't like our government that much. Uh, it is... <laughs> I, my personal opinion is typically governments suck. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, governments suck and uh, people are pretty decent. Um, most governments are horrible. Most people are decent. You do find some piece of garbage people and I don't know of any good government. So that's my opinion. 
Um, but yeah, I want to check out this, the Ethiopian conflict, who's fighting who and why. And this is from Al Jazeera, um, English, Al Jazeera English for a reference. Just a nice little seven minute clip to get into uh, the Ethiopian conflict that I don't really know a lot about. So let's check it out. Oh my goodness. For a long time, it was seen as one of Africa's big success stories. With a booming economy and a charismatic leader who won the Nobel Peace Prize. But right now, things are looking really bad. The conflict between the government and Tigray rebels is escalating. A civil war fueled by ethnic divisions has been going on for a year. The front lines keep shifting, and there's even been talk that the fighting could reach the capital, Addis Ababa. All right, again, we started out the beginning. Yeah, I feel you. Most of them do. So here's the feeling here. Um, Africa had, like, what, 1,200 tribes that ruled the continent. And then the European settlers tried to break it into colonies. And then we tried to draw up some lines, and we drew it up. We drew 1,200 tribes into 50, or was it 49 countries? And there's been war ever since kind of weird or planned kind of planned I think it's kind of planned there are reports of massacres sexual violence and accusations that food is being used as a weapon of war by all sides there is you know, something like 20 million Ethiopians who are in need of some form of, of aid at the moment so who's fighting who and what are they fighting about how was that Let's start with the big picture. Ethiopia is about the size of France and Spain combined. It has the second biggest population in Africa with lots of different ethnic groups. There's a federal government based in Addis Ababa led by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. And there are 11 regions. They're mostly divided according to different ethnic groups and each region has its own government. Tigray way up north is where most of the fighting has been happening over the past year. It's led by the Tigray People's Liberation Front, the TPLF. Now all this started because of a power struggle between the TPLF and the federal government, but it's gone way beyond that now. The TPLF has been working to destabilize the country, committing many acts that threaten the unity of the people and the sovereignty and existence of the country. He's been doing everything in his power to make sure that the people of Tigray uh, continue to find themselves at the receiving end of his uh, genocidal campaign. Now we've moved into a phase where both sides believe that they are fighting an existential struggle for their survival. What you have to understand is the TPLF used to run things. They dominated Ethiopia's national politics for nearly 30 years as the main party in a coalition government, although Tigrayans only make up 6% of the population. It was a time of huge economic growth, but the TPLF were also accused of being autocratic and corrupt. In 2018, huge protests brought them down and swept Abiy Ahmed into power. And right after he was elected, he made some big changes. He freed thousands of political prisoners who'd been thrown in jail by the previous government and surprised everyone with a peace deal with Eritrea. That's what he got his Nobel Peace Prize for. He also tried to centralize the government more. He created a new national party that brought together the main ethnic political groups. But the TBLF refused to take part, and they were suspicious of Abiy. Yeah, I don't know about that. You guys thought that wasn't... All right. I, mean, I still feel like Trump was trying to start a war with Russia when he shot the mother of all bombs into Syria and assassinated... Uh, General, and Solomon, uh, General Soleimani, but uh, I mean, I thought that was trying to go to, to war with Russia. Like, I thought he was literally trying to start war in Russia, but yeah, I mean, we all have different views on that. His big plans to open up politics and the economy. There was a sense he was trying to boost the power of the government in Addis Ababa at the expense of the regions. The TPLF believed that Abiy Ahmed was consolidating his power by um, completely um, undermining their legacy. So you had all this political jockeying, and then in 2020, there were supposed to be federal and regional elections, but the government delayed them, saying it was because of COVID. That didn't go down well with the TPLF. They went ahead and ran their election in defiance of federal authority, and this led to a process where the federal government said that Tigray's government was not legal and constitutional, 
um, and Tigray's government made the same accusation against the federal government. And that's when the fighting started. The forces yes. loyal to the TPLF attacked a government military base in Tigray. Then, Abiy sent in troops. At first, government forces had the upper hand. They quickly took control of Tigray's capital, Mekele, and Abiy declared victory. But it wasn't over. The TPLF forces kept fighting back. And you also had Eritrean troops joining in. They came over the border in the north to fight on the federal government's side. But by the end of June, and despite Eritrean involvement, there was a complete reversal. The TPLF were back in control of Mekele and most of Tigray. And they didn't stop there. They pushed into the neighboring regions of Amhara and Afar. Then there was another big development, this time in the Oromia region, where there's an armed group called the Oromo Liberation Army, the OLA. They have their own issues with Abiy. They decided to ally themselves with the TPLF, which means now you've got a kind of opposition alliance that wants to defeat Abiy. Several groups from other regions say they've joined too. The OLA are fighting from the south and the Tigrayans from the north, and they both say they're determined to push towards the capital. Now, when the TPLF forces took control of two strategic towns in late October, that threat suddenly looked pretty serious. But by early December, the government said its forces had recaptured those towns, so the military balance seems to be shifting again. It seems to be a pretty fluid situation. There's huge amounts of mobilization on the federal side, including the prime minister going to the battlefield himself. So that's how the fighting has played out so far. But what about the civilians? Well, it's been devastating and brutal. All sides involved have been accused of atrocities. Airports have been attacked, uh, schools, uh, hospitals, church, mosques, in addition to unlawful killing, uh, execution, uh, torture, and a huge number of uh, you know, sexual, sexual and uh, gender-based violence. More than two million people have been forced to leave their homes to escape the fighting. There are estimates that hundreds are dying every day in Tigray because there isn't enough food. And the UN says millions are at risk of starvation. This boy is a victim of what the UN says is the world's worst hunger crisis. Only a trickle of food has been getting through, nowhere near what's needed. Both the government and TPLF forces are accused of restricting aid deliveries into areas they control. There have also been reports of horrific massacres, like in Aksum, a town in Tigray, where Eritrean forces killed hundreds of people, according to Amnesty International. And in Mai Khadra, another town in Tigray, where up to 600 civilians were reportedly killed. Jesus. All right, well, if this is supposedly done, that would just be fantastic. Because that's fucking horrible. Um, I had another segment, but I think you guys want to move on. That is my feeling. <laughs> Let's get to the biggest fucking talk of the day. Let's get through first a couple minutes here. All right. Sarcasm. Thank you for clarifying that. Sarcasm. I like that. Um. All right. Get a cloak. They say this is the most urgent one. So tanks. Tanks. We have taken steps over the course of many months, including over the summer, uh, to see to it that partners are in a position to provide tanks to Ukraine. Ukraine has has tanks. I don't want to leave you with the misimpression uh, that Ukraine doesn't have tanks. Ukraine has hundreds uh, of tanks. Uh, so point A. Uh, when it comes to any saying the request is irrational. When it when it when it comes to any particular capability, you've heard us say this before, and you actually tanks, uh, tanks. summed it summed it up. This is a sovereign decision on the part of each country to decide what types of security assistance uh, to provide what they're in a position to provide. We applaud all of our allies and partners for what they have done so far. And I just recounted some of that we've heard uh, over the past 72 hours or so. Uh, we've previously, when it comes to Germany, uh, applauded its announcements that they'll send Ukraine infantry fighting vehicles, ML MLRS systems, air defense capabilities, including the IRST air defense system, and as I mentioned before, a Patriot missile battery. We also applaud the decision by the UK, as I mentioned before, to send these Challenger tanks to Ukraine. Um, we will continue to- Yay, everybody said tanks, 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 tanks. Do our part to provide Ukraine with what it needs. I mentioned okay. our latest uh, provision of security assistance that we announced uh, on Thursday and Friday. Uh, that was the 30th drawdown of so-called presidential drawdown authority, 30 times now. Uh, we have announced um, 
hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars worth of security assistance uh, to Ukraine. And on Friday, we announced that we'll provide more than 500 armored vehicles uh, to Ukraine, in addition to the Bradley fighting vehicles that we've previously announced. I, I see you, with, I see you uh, having a follow-up question. I, I suspected you would go there. Uh, our, our role there will be con to continue to speak with our Ukrainian partners, uh, to speak with our allies. I expect you to go there. <laughs> including in the context of, context of NATO, including in the context of the Defense Contact Group, to determine uh, the needs of the Ukrainian fighters, uh, and also what members of this coalition of some 50 countries are in a position to provide. We are not going to be prescriptive. Uh, the only thing that we're continuing to prescribe uh, is that President Putin's aggression will be continue to be a strategic failure. Uh, we are going to provide Ukraine with what it needs uh, to take on the battle that it's facing at any given moment. We can say that until we're blue in the face, but more importantly, we can continue to demonstrate that. And I think you see that with the success that our Ukrainian partners have had on the battlefield, uh, including uh, with the security assistance that we provided in some 50 other countries around the world. Yes. Security assistance. They love that word. Security assistance. It's not massive amounts of weapons and money. It's security assistance. That sounds heartwarming. I wonder how many panels they had before they found that one. I wonder how many panels they pushed through before they found that one. The head of Russia, the mercenary partner who sent a message of objection to the White House. All right, so this is the next subject, the Wagner Group. Escalation, absolutely. These tanks being sent made them send the, the countdown to midnight, being the nuclear war countdown, from two minutes to, to 90 seconds. The tanks being sent into Ukraine moved the, the nuclear war clock 30 seconds ahead. That was what happened. That's, that's the planet's response. <laughs> Wait for those tanks to arrive in the battlefield? I mean, I'm sure they're going to wait for the ones in America, the, the American ones that supposedly won't get there till August. I'm sure they'll wait super long for those ones. They're, they're definitely going to hold on, hold back for that. All right, so we're going to talk about the Wagner Group for a minute. I don't, um, I'm not an expert on the Wagner Group by any means. So, again, uh, this is the beginning of it. The, the head of Russia's mercenary Wagner Group sent a message of action to the White House. I cannot understand her. A message of objection to the White House. Refuting the arms deal between North Korea and the Wagner Group announced by the White House. The arms deal between North Korea and the Wagner Group announced by the White House last week. Last week, and they asked what the crime was. And they asked what the crime was. What is this? What is the State Department's position of the objection of the Wagner Group? State Department's position of the objection of the Wagner Group. Well, I, I would note that uh, this letter from Mr. Prigozhin to uh, my colleague at the White House uh, came uh, precisely in the aftermath of uh, the White House declassifying additional information regarding uh, the Wagner Group's activities uh, inside Ukraine, uh, the Wagner Group's uh, the support that is receiving from uh, the DPRK, uh, not to mention the uh, a broader discussion about the destabilizing influence that the Wagner Group is having, not only in Ukraine, uh, but in other parts of the world, including in parts of... Uh... Ah, yes, the destabilizing effects that the Wagner Group have had because the American CIA have had little to no regime change, destabilization, coup attempts, assassination attempts, drug deals, weapons deals. Uh... Sorry, I even lost where I was at. <laughs> Jesus, dude. Africa. Uh, so we've gone to great lengths uh, to explain our concerns uh, with uh, the Wagner Group. We have declassified information. We've declassified uh, imagery. We've spoken uh, to our concerns in the Ukrainian context and the broader context. Yeah. Uh, and I think I'll let those comments speak for themselves. Uh, regarding UN Security Council. Regarding UN Security um, Council sanctions, if China and Russia oppose sanctions against. Sanctions. If China and Russia oppose sanctions against the Wagner Group. The Wagner Group, will the U.S. pursue its own sanctions? Will the U.S. pursue its own sanctions? Uh, yes, and we are. Uh, what the White House noted uh, last week is that we are imposing additional uh, designations, uh, using additional authorities to pursue uh, the Wagner Group. This is uh, a group that uh, for <laughs> quite some time uh, has been subject to U.S. sanctions. Uh, we imposed further sanctions in March of 2022. They're just trolling the White House? Well, they got them to bite because they asked several questions to the DOS. 
<laughs> um, they asked several, several questions. Um, let's move on to the next ones. Because, yeah, they definitely hit them. Um, so 124. Peace. 124. Union partners turning the lights back on, being in a position to turn those lights back on uh, within uh, hours or even minutes uh, of these deadly strikes, I think speaks to uh, not only the Ukrainian resourcefulness, but also the determination of countries around the world to provide that. Uh, but we're also thinking about the longer term, how we can make Ukraine's, help Ukraine's uh, energy infrastructure uh, to be uh, stronger, more resilient, uh, uh, green, uh, how we can see to it that it is integrated uh, with that of Europe as well. And then, can, I, can I have a follow up on? Also on Ukraine, uh, the designation of the Wagner Group as its power within the military or the Russian military organization rises. Um, how, could you speak for a few minutes about how, or for a second, about how you think, what do you think the impact of that would be? Would that be helpful and how soon? Sure. Uh, so I, I will uh, limit my comments today because we spoke to it yesterday at some length. And I... But you know, Viceroy, that we are the king of all hypocrisy. That's what we do. We live in the world of hypocrisy. That's what we live. We, we love blaming Russia. We love blaming China for things that we do on the regular. And that is how we get by through the day. I expect we'll have more to say uh, later this week. But uh, suffice to say, we have uh, a number of authorities that we've already uh, levied against uh, the Wagner Group uh, to attempt to counter some of its um, nefarious activities around the world. It is a primary export of chaos, of instability, of violence. We see that uh, in Ukraine, but we also see that uh, in other parts of the world, including in Africa. Uh, the announcement that you heard that uh, we would label the Wagner Group as a uh, transnational criminal organization provides us with uh, another tool. It will leave uh, senior officials and employees of the Wagner Group susceptible to visa bans. Uh, for example, it will allow uh, our law enforcement entities to work with law enforcement uh, counterparts around the world uh, to counter uh, the Wagner Group's activities from uh, that angle. But again, we are going to use every appropriate uh, and relevant authority we have uh, to try to uh, counter, to try to um, uh, uh, neutralize uh, what this group is attempting to do around the world. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. <laughs> uh, Wagner, 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 Wagner Group. Putin said Wagner Group a hundred times? Or did he say... I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to follow. Let's check out a little Wagner Group video quick, huh? A Wikivide Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Wagner Group. The Wagner Group, also known as BMC Wagner, CHVK Wagner, or CHVK Wagner, is a Russian paramilitary organization. Some have described it as a private military company, whose contractors have reportedly taken part in various conflicts, including operations in the Syrian civil war on the side of the Syrian government as well as, from 2014 until 2015 in the war in Donbass and Ukraine aiding the separatist forces of the self-declared Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. Others are of the opinion that CHVK Wagner is really a unit of the Russian Ministry of Defense in disguise, which is used by the Russian government in conflicts where deniability is called for. The Wagner Group has also been compared with Academy, the American security firm formerly known as Blackwater. History, organization, status. The founder of... So yeah, that's who they compare it to, is Blackwater, who, I guess, what, they were the ones that put water cannons on our, our peaceful protester, water protesters. So that's a good group to be compared to. The company is reported to be Dmitry Valerievich Yutkin, who was born in Kirovarad Oblast in 1970. According to the Security Service of Ukraine's statement in September 2017, Dmitry Yutkin used to be a Ukrainian citizen up until 2013. He was a lieutenant colonel and brigade commander of a special forces unit of Russia's main intelligence directorate. He retired in 2013 and began working for the private company Moran Security Group founded by Russian military veterans. The company performed security and training missions around the world, specializing in security against piracy. The same year, senior Moran Security Group managers were involved in setting up a St. Petersburg-based organization Slavonic Corps that headhunted contractors to protect oil fields and pipelines in Syria. Yutkin was in Syria as part of the Slavonic Corps and survived its disastrous mission. The Wagner Group itself first showed up in 2014, along with Yutkin in the Luhansk region of Ukraine. The company's name comes from Yutkin's own call sign, which he allegedly chose due to a passion for the Third Reich. In August 2017, 
The Turkish Yeni Seyfak speculated that Utkin was possibly just a figurehead for the company, while the real head of Wagner was someone else. On 9 December 2016, Dmitry Utkin was photographed with Russian President Vladimir Putin at a Kremlin reception given to highly decorated service people to mark the Day of Heroes of the Fatherland, along with three persons, Alexander Kuznetsov, Andrei Bogatov, and Andrei Troshev. The photo was published shortly after and caused a scandal. Kuznetsov was said to be the commander of Wagner's first reconnaissance and assault company, Bogotov was the commander of the fourth reconnaissance and assault company, and Troshev served as the company's executive director. A few days after, the Kremlin spokesman confirmed the presence at the Kremlin reception of a person called Dmitry Yutkin as a representative of the Novgorod region. He said the reception was organized for those who had been awarded the Order of Kar- It's wiki -vitty, so this is, you know, this is American British standard, right? Wiki Vidi documentaries. That's going to be, this is going to be American British propaganda, right? Got to understand our source, I guess, right? Like it's. Rage and the title hero of the Russia and was unable to elaborate further. Wagner was in 2016, 2017, believed to have a membership of 1,000, 5,000, be registered in Argentina, and have its members train at a Russian mod facility Molkino near the village of Krasnodar Krai. The company also has offices in St. Petersburg. According to a report published by Russian monthly Sovashino Sakretno, the organization that hired personnel for Wagner did not have a permanent name and had a legal address near the military settlement Pavshino in Krasnogorsk, near Moscow. The pay of Wagner private military contractors, who are usually retired regular Russian servicemen aged between 35 and 55, is estimated to be between 80,000 and 250,000 Russian rubles a month. One source also stated the pay was as high as 300,000. When new PMC recruits arrive at the training camp, they are no longer allowed to use social network services and other internet resources. Company employees are not allowed to post photos, texts, audio and video recordings, or any other information on the internet that was obtained during their training. Company employees are not allowed to tell anyone their location, whether they are- That's any freaking, that's any, uh, secret sir. you know, um, I mean, any military personnel that's doing any special ops of any sort, that's all of them. So yeah, that makes sense. You think CIA freaking plants tell their wives where they're going to go assassinate somebody? <laughs> In Russia or another country. Mobile phones, tablets and other means of communication are left with the company and issued at a certain time with the permission of their commander. Passports and other documents are surrendered, and in return company employees receive a nameless dog tag with a personal number. The comp What? You lose your fucking passports and you get a nameless dog tag? Yeah, this sounds fucking- this is some straight 4500, like in our kind of- so you're saying they're going way too high on their currency? way too high on their pay blowing their pay out of fucking proportion yeah i mean this is some straight freaking propaganda right like this is some straight wiki vidi we're definitely not subscribing to you because you're straight propaganda company only accepts new recruits if a 10-year confidentiality agreement is established and in case of a breach of the confidentiality the company reserves the right to terminate the employee's contract without paying a fee during their training the pmcs receive a 1100 dollars monthly pay Wagner is also believed to have a Serbian unit, which was until at least April 2016 under command of Davor Savisic, a Bosnian Serb who was a member of the Serb Volunteer Guard during the Bosnian War, and Serbia's Special Operations Unit during the Kosovo War. His call sign in Bosnia was Elvis. Savisic was reportedly only three days in the Luhansk region when a BTR armored personnel carrier fired at his checkpoint, leaving him shell-shocked. After this, he left to be treated. He was also reported to have been involved in the first offensive to capture Palmyra from the Islamic State in early 2016. One member of the Serbian unit was killed in Syria in June 2017, while the Security Service of Ukraine issued arrest warrants in December 2017 for six Serbian PMCs that belonged to Wagner and fought in Ukraine, including Savisic. In early February 2018, the SBU reported that one Serb member of Wagner, who was a veteran of the conflict in Syria, had been killed while fighting in eastern Ukraine. In early October 2017, the SBU said that Wagner's funding in 2017 had been increased by 185 million rubles and that around 40 Ukrainian nationals were working for Wagner, with the remaining 95% of the personnel being Russian citizens. One Ukrainian was killed in Syria while fighting in the ranks of Wagner in March 2016. It has been reported that Russian businessman Yevgeny Prigozhin, who is also a chef for Russian President Putin, has links with Wagner and Dmitry Yudkin personally. Goshan, who was sanctioned by the United States Department of the Treasury. <laughs> yeah, they were sanctioned. 
Yeah, I think we gotta be done with this, right? We gotta be done with this. Let's move on. <sighs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, all right. Let's go back to 124. Let's hear some more of Ned. Not, um, let's just take it from the beginning. What do we got here? 124. We got 1024. Let's get through Ned. Uh, we, we have we have not uh, taken capabilities off the table. Again, this is a conversation based on what our Ukrainian partners need, when they need it, where they need it. Yes. Uh, yeah. The New York Times story gave a couple of story that uh, Ukraine has suspended ten of its military officials for some sort of corruption. Uh, is the U.S. making sure that all the aid that has been given and given to the is going uh, to the right people and they're not building uh, themselves into things? Uh, we absolutely are. We take. Are we taking extraordinary precautions? We are extraordinarily taking, seriously our responsibility extraordinarily seriously are the precautions ability to ensure appropriate oversight of all forms uh, of u.s assistance that uh, we are delivering to ukraine We're act there is literally like documents showing that like well not documents there's like you can so you know all missiles and all like high-end weaponry now have computer chips in them so we can see where they go and we can literally see that like only like 30% of them are staying in Ukraine and the other 70% are getting funneled into Syria, getting funneled into Niger and Somalia and other places. So that's absolute bullshit. We can see it happening. Like Intel can actually see it happening. To engage uh, with the government of Ukraine to ensure accountability. Uh, there are challenges associated with uh, the current uh, environments in which uh, our Ukrainian partners are in the midst of a brutal attack by uh, the Russian Federation, but uh, we take this commitment seriously nonetheless, and we're still uh, able to take steps to ensure uh, that accountability. We have teams in Kyiv, we have teams back here in Washington who are working literally around the clock to support our Ukrainian partners. And a key focus is to ensure uh, safeguards both for the accountability of uh, weaponry as well as adherence to the laws of war uh, are built into all assistance efforts as we help Ukraine defend its sovereignty and its territorial integrity uh, against this ongoing aggression. We'll continue to work to ensure uh, the, assist the assistance uh, we provide uh, is subject to that oversight, the security assistance, the humanitarian assistance, the economic assistance. And when it comes to that security assistance, to ensure uh, that everything we provide uh, is in compliance with uh, our Leahy laws, international humanitarian law, and other applicable requirements. Yes, I am sure that international human humanitarian law is going to go really well with all the missiles and tanks that we're sending. You fucking idiot. It's just business for America. Oh, it's no. It's it's not just business for America. It's business for Russia. It's business for the UK and France. Anybody who makes weapons right now, their stocks are going up. This is all about sending out weapons and and what was um shit. Um, you know the best way, the best thing about a war is to test out your weapons, right? To test out your new weapons. Well, we got a lot of new weapons we need to test out. And this war is a great way for them to do that. And put it, you know, put a big dollar sign on all these new weapons and new tanks that we can test out against each other. And of course, consistent with respect for human rights and democratic values that we share uh, with our Ukrainian partners. Um, this is a robust system of oversight and accountability. Uh, we thank Congress for providing us with additional resources uh, to see to it that we're able to conduct this oversight. Uh, and thank you, Congress, for giving us more money so that we can make sure that the money that you've given us goes to the right people thank you so much congress we are blessed to have you <laughs> all right 18 40. god i just gonna push through these clips so we can get them all together and out uh, there Finland might try and join nato alone and then he backtracked later in, in comments um to uh, reuters i believe um is that something that uh, Finland joining NATO alone, is that something that the U.S. would, would support? Uh, do you have any comment on that? Is that a bad idea? What we would support is Finland and, okay. excuse me, Finland and Sweden uh, joining NATO at the earliest opportunity. I spoke. We would enjoy if Finland and Swin Sweden could just get into NATO already. That's what we would enjoy. We would enjoy it if they could get in there as soon as fucking possible. That would relieve tensions on the planet. That would relieve tensions. No, it wouldn't. It, it would escalate. Escalate. You idiot. Everything you guys do is escalation. The American government wants to escalate tensions everywhere. That's why we're trying to push with Taiwan. That's why uh, we'll get into that later. I'm sorry. Jesus. I had some links to this yesterday. Uh, they are ready. Uh, these are countries with advanced uh, militaries, militaries that have exercised with the United States and those of other NATO yeah. allies. Uh, these are advanced democracies. Countries. I'm joining separately. 
Uh, again, we're not going to comment on a hypothetical. What we believe is we're not going to not, not compliment on a hypothetical. That Finland and Sweden are ready to join the alliance. Uh, it's not only the view of the executive branch, it's the view of uh, the legislative branch as well. You saw that in the swift accession process and the uh, Senate's ratification of uh, the treaty uh, last year. This is a point we've made uh, very clearly, repeatedly, in public and private uh, to all of our partners, including to our Turkish allies in this case. Uh, and it's a point that we'll continue to make. Yeah. The question is whether you think that they should join together or whether one could join before another one. The discussion? You know, and, and it's not a hypothetical. <laughs> well, it is, it is a hypothetical because, as your colleague well, mentioned, it's, a, it's it, a hypothetical it, as they'll ever get in in the first place. But the question is whether the U.S. whether the U.S. thinks that they should go in together, or whether Finland. And, this is and this has always Sweden been. Should this, go in first. This is so you just got healthier. So so the sanctions just made you a healthier person. <laughs> you can stop eating junk food for a little bit. It's always been a conversation about Finland and Sweden. And joining NATO. That, that, that's uh, fine. That, that, that is that is precisely that is what the administration thinks. That is is, is, is the best. Uh, intellectual. That clip was their militia, not their actual military. That was their militia, but that was their entire militia. That was the entirety of their militia. Yeah. Is it, 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 best for the alliance, right? Is it? Do, do you guys think that it would be better for them to join together, or do you have no objection to the idea of? Finland going first. Of course we want to see Finland and Sweden join the alliance. This has always been a discussion about Finland. Oh, and this was the, oh. Finland and Sweden, two countries. No, that is not. Moving right. from an alliance of 28 to an alliance of 30. The alliance. We want them in the alliance. we got to get them in the alliance. Um, he says alliance so many times. That's the alliance. It's It feels like like Star Wars or something. I don't know. Um, it's a little creepy, and that's, that's why I had to end right the, the, the alliance. Dun, dun, the alliance. We'll get them in the alliance. Um, just, yeah, just a little too much. A little too much. He's a moron. Let's wait until back. Yes, in the back. Uh, yeah, Ita. Thank you. Um, Special Envoy Rob Malley uh, has said that um, the U.S. has been pushing China not to buy oil from Iran. Would you shed some light on that, please, and what the Chinese response may have been? Uh, Sure, Gita. So we have uh, been clear and consistent uh, about the need for countries uh, around the world uh, to enforce uh, sanctions that are on the books and uh, as appropriate to increase. So he says he's been, the U.S. has been pushing countries around the world to enforce sanctions that are on the books, as in the USA. All right, slow down, intellectual, slow down. <laughs> Breathe. Um... <laughs> So the USA says that there's sanctions on a country and then every country on the planet is supposed to act like our books or their books. We are trying to get everybody else to enforce the sanctions that are on the books. That's what he just said. The fuck? Uh, the pressure on the Iranian regime in response to uh, its intransigence. Uh, we are regularly and robustly engaged uh, with the day-to-day -day business of enforcing our sanctions. Uh, including uh, with regular and effective communications with allies and partners uh, about those attempting to evade our sanctions. Uh <laughs> what if a NATO country say Fu future Finland elects a racist nutter that prov provokes a war, so we need to support them? Yeah, we do. We need to, uh... yeah, we're not, I mean, but we have, like, every country has to listen to our sanctions. Iran supplied drones to Russia and Israel bombed their sink, their factory. Israel's bombing uh, a lot of stuff in Syria and Iran. They are, um, Israel has ramped up their fucking, their war efforts a lot lately. They're actually going to be one of our last subjects of the night. Actually, I think they're our next subject coming up is Israel. That's literally the next thing we're going to clip off of here in a little bit. As Iran's largest oil customer, the PRC remains a top focus for our sanctions enforcement. Uh, we regularly engage with the PRC and other countries to discourage them from taking steps vis-a-vis -vis Iran uh, um, that, uh, from taking steps vis-a-vis -vis Iran that have the potential to undermine U.S. sanctions. Uh, we don't preview potential sanctions actions, but we continue to monitor Iran's oil experts uh, and to engage Iran's trading partners about the possibility of exposure to U.S. sanctions. And that possibility of exposure 
is not just a, an academic question or a hypothetical. All right, let's move on to the next day. Oh. Iran and Israel have been playing proxy wars for a moment. U.S. Justice Department arrests people all the time who are not U.S. citizens in foreign countries that broke U.S. law. Yeah, no, like, we can't arrest people if it's not in our greater good. Like, he said that so fucking, just so boldly. Like, we arrest people outside of our border all the time. All the time. And detain them without probable cause and detain them for years in Guantanamo. That's not even, like, close to true. All right. So we're on 125. Okay, so we're going to jump around here a little bit to get to Israel. First, I think, something else. In conflict that will allow Russia to rest, refit, regroup, repair, uh, and reattack. Uh, we want to see to it that ah. when this comes to an end, uh, Ukraine is in a position where it can deter uh, against that going forward and, uh, if necessary, again, defend itself. Um, this is part of that long-term deterrence capacity uh, that we focused on with our FMF funding, that we focused on uh, uh, in terms of other uh, provision of security assistance. It's, it's very important to us. Uh, it's very important to President Zelensky. So just to summarize, um, the administration believes that it's, it's more likely that Russia could back off militarily um, if Ukraine has more advanced weaponry? It is <laughs> uh, two things, really. Um, one, we're talking about... Uh, putting Ukraine in the strongest possible position for the aggression that it's facing now. Uh, this aggression is, as President Zelensky has said, uh, almost certainly going to end at the negotiating table. Uh, we want Ukraine to be in the strongest possible position when that table emerges. That's why we're providing them uh, with a presidential drawdown uh, authority, uh, the 30 uh, PDAs that we've announced so far, the 27, uh, nearly $28 billion in security assistance that uh, we've provided so far. Uh, but when that time comes, uh, and uh, there is, and into this conflict. We want, that's why we're providing them uh, with the presidential drawdown uh, authority, uh, the 30 uh, PDAs that we've announced so far, the 27, uh, nearly $28 billion in security assistance that uh, we've provided so far. Uh, but when that time comes uh, and uh, there is an end to this conflict, we want that resulting piece to be just, and I won't go through that again, but to be durable. Uh, durable meaning it is not just a moment in time uh, where a week later, a month later, a year later, or 10 years later, uh, Russia decides uh, to rest, regroup, regroup, regroup refit, refit, uh, and reattack. Re he says that twice. He, that we, we can't let them rest, regroup, refit, reattack. Rest, regroup, refit, reattack. We can't let them rest, regroup, refit, merit. All right, dude. We get it. All right, let's do this fucking beginning. And then we need to get to Israel. Not. Like, we are or you still you consider Ukraine, I mean Crimea to be you, part of Ukraine. Most right? importantly, first so of all, be, so that would be defensive. Most importantly, first of all, Crimea is Ukraine. That has been our position since 2014. That is our position now. That will be our position going forward. Uh, that will never change. All right, that part was weird, right? Crimea is Ukraine, and that will never change. Um, Crimea was definitely Russia, and that will definitely change at some point. That's a stupid thing to say, Olman. Um, that was just stupid. Um, uh, do I have anything else from the 25th? I do. <clears throat> 54, 43. Let's get one more from today. This is 25th, not today. So I don't want to uh, get ahead of that. Um, on Regarding the Iranian nexus, uh, sanctions enforcement first are uh, sanctions um, as our international sanctions are continue to be uh, uh, enforced. We continue to enforce them. Sanctions enforcement uh, is an iterative process. We routinely have- Sanctions are forced. We will continue to enforce them. Sanction for enforcement is a force that we must be enforced. Wasn't, okay, so Crimea being Russia, it wasn't, wasn't there literally an Olympics in Crimea and that was the Russian Olympics? Wasn't that like a thing just recently? Am I fucking losing my shit? Was that 2016 when there was an Olympics in Crimea and that was like the Russian Olympics and the whole fucking world was fine with that and everybody was celebrating and everything was good and now we're fucking, I mean, I would, so, I mean, I watch a lot of Ava Bartlett, Van Watt. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of them. They're uh, Canadian 
um, Canadian journalist who's currently living in Russia. And from my understanding, people in Ukraine can think that they're Russian or Ukrainian. People in Crimea can think that they're Russian or Ukrainian. Um, I mean, that all those borders, those people have moved around, their families, you know, it's, it's, borders are fucking irrelevant, right? Borders aren't people. Like, if, that's like saying, like, if my family lives in, um, one state and then all of a sudden America divides that they're not my family because they live, because America got split up or something? No, that's not how things work. Engagements, uh, with partner governments, uh, and, and with the private sector, uh, to make them aware of, uh, the scope of our sanctions, uh, and- Yeah, just more sanction talk. Sanction, sanction, sanctions. 125. I want to go to 54. There we go. Trying to find a way to end this war that is affecting many countries, including African nations. So what is the view of U.S. on how African nations can help with the end of this war? I would start by saying that African nations are in a, a unique and special position uh, to lend their voices to uh, ideally help bring about an end to President Putin's aggression. And I say that. Yeah, we need we need Africa to step up and help the war against Russia. Fucking, I can't believe these people sometimes. Because so many African nations have histories and legacies that are shaped by colonialism. Yeah, okay, yeah. Because they were shaped by white European countries, they should help us stop Russia from... I, what? Uh, their histories and legacies uh, have been morphed and, uh, in some cases, uh, distorted. Uh, by the efforts of our allies, of our allies, of the French and British, which are the United States' allies. And we probably help them in many of those situations with taxes or arms or something. Jeez, oh, Pete. Uh, other countries to do what Russia is trying to do to Ukraine. Uh, to redraw borders arbitrarily. To to redraw borders arbitrarily. Again, we white people drew borders for Africa arbitrarily, according to our interest, not to the people's interest, which is why they still have fucking wars over borders, which borders don't even fucking matter, really. Borders are... Oh. Dictate uh, to countries uh, what their orientation should be, what their choices should be. Uh, across the continent of Africa. Uh, there is deep respect for the UN system, for the UN charter, for uh, international law. And I think that deep respect is born of the fact, uh, of the fact that uh, for uh, many decades across the continent, uh, those principles weren't adhered to. Uh, and uh, the principles that are at the heart of the UN charter, at the heart of international law, uh, were disregarded. Uh, and so African countries feel this acutely. Uh, African countries feel NATO's laws being disregarded. African countries get fucking, oh, oh man. Na yeah, I mean, NATO, NATO, oh. Why would Africa side with NATO? Why would Africa side with, why? Why would we, why, why, why? We think what countries across the continent and across the world can do uh, most effectively is to make clear where they stand, uh, to make clear to uh, Russia, to visiting Russian interlocutors, uh, but also to countries around the world that they stand for the UN system, they stand for the UN charter, they stand for international law, and they stand against uh, any effort to subvert that. Uh, African countries know all too well the consequences of a systematic subversion uh, of those very principles. And because we did it to them. Because Western fucking civilization did it to them. So why would they side with the countries that did it to them? Why would, Russia didn't tear their continent apart, draw up the indivisible lines, and steal their resources. France, the UK, and Britain did. And the United States helped. So why... Germany did, and Portugal did, and all these countries that are on the opposite side. Why would they fucking take our side? Lending their voice uh, and making clear, not only to the Russian Federation, but to the rest of the world, that it's not something they will tolerate, that itself would be very powerful. And do you think it's appropriate, for example, for African nations who have received a lot of support from Russia in years uh, to right now kind of give back to them? Because we heard also from the Congress that the United States is trying to pass 
some kind of law to force African nations not to work with Russia. But do you think this is uh, uh, a right decision for African nations to do right now when it comes to deal with uh, Russia? I think what you're pointing to is uh, just a historical reality. Uh, it is, uh, again, born of the fact that uh, for many decades, the United States was not in a position to be a partner uh, to so many countries across the African continent. Uh, and for various reasons, uh, the Soviet Union was, or, exactly. or Russia was. Exactly. Uh, that, of course, has changed. That dynamic no longer holds. It eroded uh, with the end of the Cold War. It has uh, gone away entirely in the decades since. The United States is ready, willing, and able uh, to be a partner of first resort uh, to the countries across Africa. You heard that very a, a partner of first resort. Please come to us first. We will help you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, like seriously, like all the countries that screwed you over, that colonized you, take their side now. Take all of their sides now. Just step in line with your fucking, just step in line like some good whipping boys. Like, this is straight racism, fucking colonialism, slavery bullshit again. Like, dude, do you even fucking hear yourself? You're saying that African nations should follow suit. That's what you're saying. That's fucked. So fucked, dude. Very clearly, uh, from President Biden, when he invited uh, African heads of state and government to Washington late last year, the U.S. Africa Leader Summit, he made very clear that we're all in on Africa in a way that the United States hasn't been able uh, to be all in on Africa uh, before. This is a dynamic that evolved over many decades. It is a dynamic that uh, will likely take uh, many years to chip away at and to ultimately reverse. Uh, but we are committed to making the investment, to demonstrating both in word and in deed, uh, that we want a true partnership, a partnership with the countries of Africa that presents both of our peoples uh, with opportunities. Uh, we are not looking to engage uh, and to use Africa as a new uh, geopolitical stomping ground or playground. Uh, we're not looking for relationships that are extractive. This is bullshit. That export chaos, that export instability, that advantage only uh, American private companies. Is bullshit. That is what the American fucking military fucking apparatus is for, is taking advantage of poor countries to help American private companies. That's literally what the American military apparatus is for. That's what the Weapons of Omen. Oh Are you kidding me? Mm hmm. Remember, Biden invited all the African leaders to DC the day that he did not have time to meet with them and sent a Lord to smash. Oh, I did not know that. I gotta look that up. African leaders came, all came to. How many of them came actually? Was it like five or ten or something? You've seen. Uh, an approach taken by countries who have a different model. Uh, our model is uh, one of true partnership, uh, where we seek to do uh, and to take on challenges and opportunities uh, with the countries of Africa together uh, in a way that provides both our people uh, greater prosperity, uh, greater stability, greater security, uh, and greater opportunity. One last one, the DRC. Uh, how do the United States expect to support the <laughs> election process? Of the 40s, 49 or 60 fucking however many countries are in Africa now. 38, 49, something like that. Eight or 10 showed up. Yeah, that sounds right. That this country will go through this year, taking into account the stability going on there. Well, we had an opportunity to uh, discuss the elections with um, the government of the DRC, with President Tshisekedi uh, and his team when we were in the DRC in, in August of, of last year. Uh, free and fair elections uh, is uh, what we advocate for around the world. Uh, we want to see. And... <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Fear, free and fair elections are what we want to see around the world. Oh, that might be the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. Holy shit, that's funny. Whew. Hmm. Oh, do I? Hold on. That's that's too funny. I mean, that's just that's just not that's just nope. Just not a thing. Not a thing at all. Free and fair elections are not what we go for. Mm hmm. All right. That was the end of this day. Let's move on to twenty six.
Oh, they grill this little freaking. I, I, first of all, let's just watch him have to. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Thursday. Um, I have oh, a few... He just moved the mics this time. So that, that podium goes up and down. And sometimes when he goes up there, he has to like lower it. And it's like, Meh. like how degrading is it that you have to lower a podium when you go up? Um, all right, we're moving. Like I said, we're moving on to Israel. They grill him on Israel the day. All right, let's just do it. Um, yeah, let's just do it. Counterparts um, uh, this, over the course of the morning, but as well as others in the region. Uh, specifically, uh, if you'll give me the opportunity, Matt, we are aware of the reports that today in Janine, at least 10 Palestinians, including militants, and at least one civilian were killed and over 20. It was 11 killed right now. One child, one old woman, 11 killed in this fucking um, assassination. Um, there was uh, a small school that was tear gassed. There were ambulances that were like um, uh, uh, nail stripped so that they can't, the, the ambulances couldn't get to the, the, the injured um, during defensive counterterrorism operation. This was a fucking assassination. This was a raid that killed civilians. De injured during an Israeli Defense Force counterterrorism operation against a Palestinian Islamic Jihad cell. We recognize you killed so many innocent civilians. You cannot call this an anti terrorist cell. Recognize the very real security challenges facing Israel and the Palestinian Authority and condemn terrorist groups planning and carrying out attacks against innocent civilians. We also regret the loss of innocent lives and injuries to civilians and are deeply concerned by the escalating cycle of violence in the West Bank. So you... <sighs> I want to underscore the urgent need for all parties to de-escalate, to prevent further loss of civilian life, and to work together to improve the security situation in the West Bank. Palestinians and Israelis equally deserve to live safely and securely. Um, okay, and it just remains the case that you... Um do not believe that the Palestinian presentations or announcement that they want to suspend all security cooperation with Israel and also take this incident and refer it to um, the UN, the ICC, and others, other other places. And they, you still think that's a bad idea? Right? That, that, that's correct, Matt. Uh, as we've made clear, and uh, the Assistant Secretary touched on this earlier today, we believe that there is an urgent need for all parties to de-escalate, and in fact, this should uh, be an opportunity to work together to improve uh, the security situation and the West Bank. And uh, as it relates uh, to the UN, we just don't believe that uh, the, this multilateral fora is appropriate for this. And this is something that the two sides should work together on. Uh, and again, we believe that this should be, uh, we should be deepening uh, our security cooperation. Okay. Well, recognizing that you don't know exactly what happened uh, in an investigation, an Israeli investigation is under, underway. Um, but recognizing that you don't know, um, I want to go back to a question that I asked Ned, you know, last year or even 18 months ago. If you don't think that the Palestinians should go to the UN or the ICC or to any other international forum, where do they go? Where do they fucking go? Where do they go when they say that, hey, this was not an attack on a terrorist cell, you guys just attacked us, and, they, and the international community says, nope, uh, Israel says it was a terrorist cell, so it's a terrorist cell. Where do the Palestinians go to refute that, to ask for an in, in, in uh, independent investigation. Where where do they go? Where? We believe that this is something that the uh, Israelis and the Palestinian authorities uh, uh, should be engaging on together uh, in dialogue with one another. Of course, the United States has made uh, quite clear that we continue to believe uh, that uh, Israel does no wrong. They do fine. They're fine. They're great. They train our cops. We're in cahoots with them. Don't worry about Israel. Steps should not be taken to uh, incite tensions to exasperate the situation and that both Palestinians and Israelis equally deserve to live safely and securely. And we continue. We don't show that. We don't fucking show that at all. No. Uh, and have made this clear uh, pretty consistently that we believe that steps that would potentially undermine a future two-state solution uh, are also uh, not helpful to this process. Yeah, yeah, but whether or not their grievance, the grievances are legitimate or not, where exactly are the Palestinians supposed to take them? Do they, if, you're, if you don't think that they can go or should go to the UN or to the ICC or to another international forum, you know, where, where do they take them? Where, where? Oh, Vice well, Roy, you should see, like, 
this, oh man, he looks so stupid and stunned at one of the questions. He's like, ah. Uh. <laughs> they should be allowed to take the part that they should take it to, to the Israelis themselves. Our belief is that this is something that should be uh, engaged on through dialogue, through diplomacy, between the Israelis, between uh, the Palestinian Authority, and of course the, the United States uh, has made its opinion on this very clear. Well, you haven't made your opinion very clear. So you think that this should, uh, that the Palestinians should take their complaints, their grievances, to the Israeli court system? I, I, I'm not just speaking about the court system specifically, Matt. I'm saying that... Okay, well, uh, uh, where? Uh, 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 I'm not... I, oh, I'm, uh, that's not, uh, mm, uh, oh, mm, uh, uh. Jesus, man. This is something that we think that should be uh, addressed through dialogue and diplomacy between uh, yeah, uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians. Uh, it's just, mm, I just, oh. And this is what he went to school for. This is what he's been training for. And he's an elite at press briefings, right? Like this is, I mean, he's not Ned Price who's got the evil grin going. Um, yeah. Authority, and we've said that quite consistently. Yeah, I love the first aid. So, what is the status of the Palestinians in this What is their status? I'm sorry. Oh, yes, you fucking just, oh man. <laughs> oh, you just stepped into it, bro. You just stepped into it. What is the status of the Palestinian people in the West Bank, including Janine, including the camp of Janine, and everywhere else in the West Bank? How do yeah, you that's gross, what right? What kind of designation do you give the Palestinians in the West Bank? That they reside in that, those territories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I mean... Uh, totally independent of the rest of the world. As if it were a different planet. Are they occupied, for instance? Do you, do you subscribe? <laughs> Oh man! Back to the fact that they are. Oh no! Know. Yeah, he gets grilled here. Um, what? This is three, three minutes of solid the occupation. So let me. Uh, it's a simple question. Are they under occupation? So let me say a couple of things. Um, uh, to the point yeah. that I believe. Are they occupied or are they not occupied? What is the status <laughs> that you give the Palestinians right at this moment? What kind of status? Do they right there. Let's all bask in this moment. That stupid face. What kind of status do they have? Come on, come on, go ahead, come on, come on. Yeah. Said, the recent period uh, has seen a sharp. I'm not talking and... about the recent period. <laughs> <laughs> I know, just oh, bask in this. Um, I'm getting goosebumps. I'm so mad at this guy. Like, oh. I am saying about legally. How do you designate the Palestinians and the West Bank? What is their status? Said, I, I I understand the question you're asking and. Uh, 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 I, I <laughs> oh man, this is too good. I gotta get a like my whole Rolodex is just gonna be thumbnails of these guys. Just thumbnails of these guys. That's just too beautiful of a stupid face. Just too. I as we've said previously, uh, it is vital <laughs> for both sides to take action to prevent even greater loss, and we condemn any violence, escalation, or provocation. Uh, we have made quite clear, and I spoke to this in addressing Matt's question, that we believe Palestinians and Israelis equally deserve to live safely and securely. Oh! <laughs> now, who guaranteed that equality? <laughs> oh. Who would guarantee that Palestinians and Israelis can actually have the same equal measures as you You know, it's not the Palestinians that keep going day after day into Israeli villages and towns and so on and attack them during night raids, killing their people. You just basically recited the Israeli story that there are nine militants killed and one civilian. You know? As if you were sure of that fact, even before an investigation went on. Where should the Palestinians go for protection? I've asked this question many times. In this he has asked this question many times in that room. He has been a constant voice which why you guys all probably know his face because I will show him every week. I will show him Grill Ned or this guy on Palestine because Palestine is not an issue Main Street Media brings up. And Palestine is an issue that comes up in the press briefings on a regular basis. And that is a disconnect. These international, these international journalists do a better job than the Americans. Simply put, right? How should the Palestinians be protected? 
cite, we have been very clear and we believe that there is an urgent need for all parties to de-escalate uh, and to work together to improve the security situation uh, in the West Bank. Right, but... <laughs> That's not... But you know that we have seen Israel as the governing authority. As the... So you think maybe they should go with like Trump's way and just stop doing the press briefings? Like, we're just going to stop doing them. You guys are being too mean. It can conduct raids any time it wants to against any Palestinian place. And we have not seen any Palestinians attack Israeli really villages for anything. So how is that equal measure? How do you guarantee it? I mean, you know, I get lost in understanding what you're saying and equal measures for both. Said, we recognize that I get lost in what you're saying, equal measures. Very real security challenges facing both Israel and the Palestinian Authority, uh, and condemn terrorist groups planning and carrying out attacks against uh, civilians. <laughs> we also, again, uh, underscore the urgent need for all parties to de-escalate to prevent further loss of civilian life and work together to improve the security situation in the West Bank and the region. And, and, and I have a couple more to see if, you if, if they are occupied, if you, if you agree that the Palestinians are under occupation, is collective punishment a war crime for any captive people, for any people under occupation? Said, uh, Isn't your view that collective punishment is a war crime? Said, uh, I'm just, uh, I think I've spoken to this pretty extensively, and what I'm just going to reiterate again is that we believe that there is an urgent need for all parties to de-escalate and to work together to improve the security system. Can you call on the Israelis to de-escalate? Do they listen to you when you, when you tell them to de-escalate? Said, we have... <laughs> Listen to you when you tell them to de-escalate. Side, we have consistently uh, called on both sides to de-escalate, and we have consistently spoken about uh, our uh, the need for both Palestinians and. Why did you say Palestinians first? Israelis are the ones that are doing all the killing. It's like seven to one body count. Israelis to equally uh, uh, deserve to live safely and securely. And, and if they don't listen to you, where should they go? Just to follow on where Matt began. Where should the Palestinians go? Again, Said, uh, we continue to believe that this is something that... Uh, he doesn't answer. He doesn't answer. He doesn't answer. All right, we'll talk about Israel Ho. Um, while we're on this day, though, let's see his little discussion on the Wagner Group. Um, 2650... Right. Yeah, ABC News. So yesterday, Ned Price said for decades, the U.S. was not in a position to be a partner in countries, but Russia was, but that that dynamic has gone away entirely. And this morning, Progrosian wrote in a letter that he has contracts with presidents in African countries, and he claims he pulls out those fighter, pulls out his fighters, those countries that cease to exist. So what does the department say to those African countries who have contracts with Progrosian or Russian entities who do feel their country would be in danger? We have clearly seen that uh, the Wagner Group, when they operate in a country, uh, they take very destabilizing, very harmful actions, uh, actions that are, uh, uh, huh, who's he talking about? Uh, are a threat to the stability <laughs> in a specific country, uh, but also the regional stability, uh, more broadly. Uh, and that was in part why, uh, the United States took the designations that it took today, uh, and will continue to take steps and assess the situation and work closely with our allies and partners to hold the Wagner Group accountable. Uh, I will also say that as it relates to deepening our cooperation in the African continent, uh, I would point no further than uh, the most recent African Leader Summit that was held in December, uh, where you saw countries from all across the continent uh, represented here, where the Secretary where President Biden had the opportunity to hold bilateral engagements uh, with uh, many representatives of these countries. Uh, you saw last year uh, the Secretary of State, USAID Administrator Power, the UN Ambassador, uh, take important uh, trips to the region. Uh, Secretary Yellen is in the region now. Ambassador Lyman Thomas Greenfield uh, just uh, returned from the region or is still there. So this is a continent that, of course, uh, we're continuing to place an important emphasis on and one where we look to uh, deepening our deep diplomatic ties with. Would the, US, would the U.S. take action against any countries that do work with progression or any of their affiliated groups? Uh, of course, uh, I will refer to our Treasury colleagues to speak to the specific ins and outs of the designations that are being made today, but uh, I would reiterate that we've been quite clear that countries uh, that uh, partner with Provision and Wagner are not, do not end up in a better place uh, afterwards. <laughs> partner with the USA, that'll put you in a really bad spot too. Uh, yeah, and then yeah, who considers themselves partners at all? Like, maybe you just, you know ran a contract with somebody or that, that that partnership is such a vague fucking term um 
All right, I gotta do a reset to get what I want here because the video that I had saved next got deleted. Thank you, US stupidness. Um, all right, but I found it again while we were playing 27th. All right, we're doing the least amount of this day. <laughs> um, and we will move on. Just one minute. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before we get started, I wanted to offer some comments on the news out of Jerusalem. Uh, this event just unfolded before I came down, and we are still gathering information. But the public reporting states that a gunman opened fire near a synagogue in Jerusalem. This is absolutely horrific. <laughs> Our thoughts, prayers, and condolences go out to those killed and injured in this heinous act of violence. We condemn this apparent terrorist attack in the strongest terms. Our commitment to Israel's security remains ironclad, and we are in direct touch with our Israeli partners, and our thoughts are with the Israeli people in light of this horrific attack. Okay, I just want to show that real quick, as we can see the contradiction, where there was literally the day before, literally the day before, there was a attack on Palestinians, and the journalists had to bring it up. The journalists had to call out if we were going to denounce this situation. The very next day, they're leading with their deepest condolences for the Israelis. So when Israelis do it to Palestinians, the journalists have to bring it up. When Israelis have anything done to them, it's the fucking first thing they fucking say. The very first thing they say. Now, I'm not saying I want anybody to die from gunshots of any fucking sort, but you just have to call it the hypocrisy, right? Like, let's call it out right away, because that is just insane. And now let's go, um, let's do Israel real quick, all right? Let's talk about Israel. As we reported, today was the deadliest day in the occupied West Bank in two decades. Israeli forces raided Janine this morning and killed nine people. In response, the Palestinian Authority cut security coordination with Israel. And it's actually 11, 11 people dead. Like I said, a, <clears throat> like a six year old child and a 62 year old woman. And this evening, there were reports of rocket fire into Israel from Gaza, which is controlled by the Palestinian militant group Hamas. The West Bank raid coincided with an announcement that Secretary of State Tony Blinken will travel to Israel and the West Bank next week. Nick Schifrin looks at U.S. policy priorities and the tense Holy Land he'll soon visit. In the West Bank's most volatile city, a most violent day. Palestinians carried out gunshot victims. They chanted the names of those killed in a fierce battle and rare daytime Israeli raid into Janine's refugee camp. A massive show of Israeli force left a building that Israel says was full of militants plotting an imminent attack, a charred, destroyed wreck. They bombed that building over a possible attack, and the very next day there's an attack. Palestinians say one of the victims was an elderly woman. The fury quickly followed. Thousands filled the streets to mourn the dead, and the militant group Hamas, which runs Gaza, vowed revenge. The resistance will always be ready to defend its people everywhere. The fallout was also political. The Palestinian Authority said... <clears throat> and he called himself the resistance, not a terrorist group, because they're trying to resist Israel killing them all. And oh, by the way, after the situation happened, at, right after um, this attack happened and they killed, you know, 11 Palestinians, uh, one of the, uh, the, Kres, the Kresnets uh, tweeted out, killed them all. One of their government officials tweeted out, killed them all. That was a government official that said that right after it happened. It would refer the raid to the UN and cut off security coordination with Israel. In light of the repeated aggression against our people, we consider that security coordination with the Israeli occupation government no longer exists. But for Israel's new government, the raid was mission accomplished. The Israeli army released body cam footage of the soldiers' raid, heavy weapons fired onto the streets below, and Palestinians opening fire on Israeli soldiers. The new ultra-nationalist Israeli national security minister, Itamar Ben-Gavir, called it a successful operation. We give backing to our fighters in the war against the terrorists. Let every police officer know, every fighter, every soldier, that he has the full backing from the Israeli government, the Ministry of National Security, and the Commissioner of Police. Janine is To kill Palestinians? 
the fuck are you talking about? largely controlled by palestinian militants and has long been a flashpoint but across the west bank the last year has been among the deadliest ever israel blames palestinian terrorism and now israel's right-wing government pushes a hard line including ben gavir's recent visit to the al-aqsa compound what jews call the temple mount judaism's holiest site in Washington, State Department Deputy Spokesman Vedant Patel called for calm. We believe that there is an urgent need for all parties to de-escalate uh, and to work together to improve the security situation uh, in the West Bank. In a separate... In <laughs> yeah, that coward shit. The Israeli military also fatally shot a 22-year-old Palestinian who confronted soldiers north of Jerusalem. For more on the violence and Secretary Blinken's upcoming trip to Israel, we turn to Aaron David Miller, senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and a longtime State Department official in both Democratic and Republican administrations. Aaron David Miller, welcome back to the NewsHour. Thanks very much. Uh, this was the deadliest incident in the West Bank in decades. How consequential might it be? I think very. Yeah, uh, like... Look, I think uh, this year, I think 29 Palestinians already in 2023 have been killed. Uh, last year was a record year of more violence. All right, this was from two days ago, the 26th, I believe. And there was already 29 people killed, already 29 Palestinians killed in 26 days. Palestinians and Israelis dying at any point since 2005. Today's raid with nine, maybe even 10 killed. You Still already have a joint statement, which is not unusual from the Palestine Islamic Jihad and um, Hamas, that um, there will be a response. The Israelis will quote unquote pay for their actions, some, some such language. As you said, it has been a violent few weeks uh, during the time when there, the new Israeli coalition took charge, but the violence preceded the coalition. This isn't only about who's leading the government right now in Israel, is it? No, absolutely. It's a gathering sort of perfect storm that's been building for quite a while. You have a 56-year-old Israeli occupation. You've got a very weak Palestinian authority. Mahmoud Abbas, I think, is now in the 18th year of a four-year term. He's lost great credibility as a consequence of canceling elections last year. He's been accused of corruption and nepotism. And uh, you also have this counterinsurgency strategy on the part of the Israelis, which since March has focused largely on Janine. I'm not sure it's, it's working or the costs of it working uh, are very high. And then finally, the emergence of uh, an Israeli government we've never quite seen before, with three ministers with budgets as well as newfound powers. Uh, whose views and sensibilities are uh, Jewish supremacist, racist, anti-democratic. You have a, a perfect storm, and it wouldn't take much, it, it seems to me, to light a match uh, a, and create a, a serious explosion. We heard uh, just before the longtime Palestinian Authority spokesman say that they would, because of this raid, cut off security coordination. They, they've said that before. It hasn't necessarily lasted. But uh, does that have an impact going forward if, indeed, that security coordination is cut off? They've suspended formal security cooperation, cooperation, but I suspect if the Palestinian Authority received information of an imminent attack, even in the West Bank against settlers or in Israel proper, that they would share that information with the Israelis. I, I suspect we will come back to Israeli-Palestinian security uh, cooperation in large part because it's, uh, it, it is in Abbas's uh, interest in order to check Hamas's growing influence in the West Bank. Into this situation, Secretary Blinken uh, hits the road in the next couple of days. We'll fly to Israel uh, and we'll visit the West Bank uh, earlier next week. Uh, what are the U.S. options when it comes to <laughs> dealing with this violence and the new Israeli government? I think bleak. I think uh, <laughs> I work for half a dozen administrations. I've rarely, actually never, bleak. seen this much intense engagement with the new Israeli government at such a senior level. I think the administration has essentially made a decision to embrace the government, but to make it unmistakably clear to hold Netanyahu uh, to what he has said repeatedly, that his hands are on the wheel, he's in charge, this is his government. I think their options, though, Nick, are, are, are very, very, very few. The best they can hope for is to try to de-escalate and keep the lid on things. Because if they really were serious about helping to create an environment or a negotiation one day, not now, uh, that could lead to a, um, uh, an end of conflict agreement, they would have to create rules of the road for both Israelis and for Palestinians. And they would have to do everything they possibly could to impose consequences on both sides if in fact those rules of the road were violated. They really would have to get into some very awkward and pleasant conversations, primarily with the Israelis. And Joe Biden, it's not an election year, but he probably will announce in the, in the next two months his intention to sec. Uh, to Ugh, that's such a horrible thought. To uh, seek a second term, it's fraught. And quickly use the term "keep a lid on the violence." That's what the U.S. wants. Historically, Israel has also wanted to keep a lid on violence, especially during a high-level U.S. visit. Is that still the case? Benjamin Netanyahu, for all of his vaunted rhetoric, has been traditionally very risk-averse when it comes to projecting Israeli military force, whether it's Gaza or or Lebanon. And I think the last thing the prime minister needs is this. On balance, it's going to be a problem for both Tony Blinken and for Benjamin Netanyahu, not to mention uh, for Palestinians. 
Yeah, that's always a fucking problem for Palestinians. <clears throat> Israel has launched multiple airstrips on the Gaza Strip. A day after... A day after they killed the nine... Israel said the air attacks targeted an underground rocket manufacturing site. And were launched after two rockets were fired from Gaza. The rockets were intercepted by Israel's Iron Dome system. The UN is calling for de-escalation from both sides. Always from both sides. They never... Always from both sides, every single time. Oops, shit. Join large scale battles with military vehicles. The online action game War Thunder has received a major update. Direct hit. Joining the battle are machines like the Soviet MiG 27M, American Abrams HC, the Swedish Viggen, and many other new vehicles. Push these modern machines to their limit on. Well, right. uh, this will certainly. And then after the. So, after a raid that killed 10. And then a night of air attacks, um, a night of missiles and air attacks, the next day. Need be of great concern. A lot of people have been hopeful after Friday prayers this afternoon that a, a certain calm seemed to prevail. That clearly isn't what's happened here. On both sides, there have been significant changes. On the Palestinian side, we are now seeing a, a new generation, really, of Palestinians who were born after the Second Intifada, who are increasingly impatient, increasingly frustrated with their lack of prospects. And in areas like Janin, where we saw the Israeli raid and, and uh, nine Palestinians were killed, the Israelis say all activists, uh, the Palestinians say two civilians were amongst the dead. Uh, in Janin and in Nablus, there are groups which are increasingly freelance. Uh, they are not affiliated particularly with either Islamic Jihad or Hamas, the two main groups, uh, armed groups uh, fighting for the Palestinians. And uh, so uh, increasingly we're seeing that the Palestinian Authority, which nominally controls the West Bank, is losing control of key cities. And so that is a new development. It's something the Israelis are only too aware of. They have been conducting regular raids, particularly in those cities, trying to target and stop, they say, uh, attacks before they might happen. At the same time, of course, we have the most right-wing Israeli government ever. In line with... So five killed in Jerusalem, 10 killed in Palestine, and they were bombed at night. So, which one should we make a bigger deal out of? Ten killed and bombed or five killed? <clears throat> they both suck. It's both a horrible situation. But this is usually what happens. Israel killed a lot of Palestinians. And then in response, somebody went and shot up a synagogue. Any other countries around the world which have swung to the right. And it's all very well saying this is the most right-wing uh, government in Israel ever. It was voted in. 10% of the votes went to very, very strongly right wing, but also, but also ultra-nationalist, ultra exactly. religious uh, Orthodox, parties. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, they were voted in. So that must be taken account of. So uh, they are, there are, among their propositions, the idea that the agencies which control the day-to-day -day life of Palestinians, there might be changes made to that. There are some in the coalition uh, talking of a, a de facto, almost annexation of the West Bank. These are things that are really worrying the Palestinians. On the other hand, last May, we saw within cities where there are Arab Israelis and Israelis. We saw some intercommunal violence. Very many people say we voted these right-wing ultra-nationalists in because we felt we needed protection. Mm. It goes on. That's the thing. It, it continues to go on. And, and the UN is calling out this endless cycle of violence. Yesterday, I did a report uh, where we saw Palestinian youths in Janine throwing rocks at police. Um, and then, you know, it, it begs... Yeah, they get killed by police. Why would they not throw rocks at them? Of course. It's the question, what, what is the international community going to do about this? Because we have, for instance, the U.S. Secretary of State, uh, Anthony Blinken, who's going to be in uh, the region in, in a couple of days. How concerned are the Americans given this uptick in violence which we're seeing? 
Well, now that this has uh, been reignited, it will become once again a more important domestic issue in Israel because for much of uh, recent years, the eyes of the rest of the world have not been turned really particularly towards the Middle East. And with the Abraham Accords, we saw Israel uh, making accords with Sudan, with Morocco, with the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, getting recognition from other countries and pursuing economic ties with these countries who are only too willing to avail of the tech opportunities, the economic opportunities, the agriculture Tourism. opportunities which Israel in partnership with these countries can offer. And so much of uh, the activity has been around these diplomatic alliances recently and of course a strategic partnership uh, against Iran. So the, Israel has been pursuing that very much. Now once again the issue of the Palestinians is coming back into the fore. Washington, there was a time when everything that happened in the Middle East was important in Washington. Washington has its hands full with Russia, with Ukraine. Nevertheless, Joe Biden has always been extremely interested in what goes on in the Middle East and Antony Blinken in a pre-planned visit will be heading uh, to uh, the region on Monday. So we'll see what comes of that. He will no doubt also point to some of the domestic changes which this coalition, this very right-wing coalition government is intending to push through, such as changes to uh, the Israeli justice system, which in a region where there are a few democracies, Israel's justice system is considered to be independent, robust, and uh, no doubt. Damn, like their cops look more like military than our cops do. <clears throat> that is intimidating and horrible. And yeah. That is our DOS. Let's get one more thing done and we can be done with this today. Ah, no, wrong one. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Okay. Okay. Oh, shit. Oh, good afternoon. Oh, wow. Whoa. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. So much excitement. I know it's what the Fed chair at meeting, right? I know. 531. Oh, good afternoon. Okay. So, on to the 27th. Oh, yeah, this is the day that they haven't cut it down yet, so I don't have exact times. I have estimated times from when she came in the room on the next steps uh, to support uh, st stability to Haiti, including support uh, to the national, uh, to Haitian National Police. And so that is a commitment uh, that the president has, and we will continue again to coordinate uh, to see what we can do. But no new forces on the ground at the moment. To, uh, I don't have anything to, uh, to announce or preview at this time. The question I have, Kirkin, is uh, what's happening in the Middle East and in Israel and, and the uh, Palestinian ter territories. We saw what happened in Jenin yesterday. We were hearing that uh, five people were killed in the uh, synagogue in Jerusalem today. I know that the uh, Secretary of State Blinken is in the yeah. area. There's a commitment to the two-state solution that's going to be reaffirmed. But is the president, does the president intend to do anything concrete towards the solution uh, this year, for instance? So, as you know, we're aware of the reports yesterday. You just mentioned Secretary Blinken's travel. So we look, we recognize the very real security challenges facing Israel and the Palestinian Authority. That is something that we recognize and condemn terrorist groups uh, planning and carrying out attacks against innocent civilians. And that is something that you will continue to hear from us, and we will be consistent on that. We also regret the loss of innocent lives and, injury, and injuries to civilians and are deeply concerned by the escalating cycle uh, of violence in the West Bank. Uh, over the past few days, our administration has been closely engaged with the Israeli and Palestinian Authority on the recent violence and to urge de-escalation. We underscore the urgent need for all uh, parties uh, to de-escalate, to prevent further loss of civilian life and work together to improve the security situation in the West Bank. Palestinians and Israelis equally deserve to live safely and securely, securely, securely. And you'll hear that. You'll hear that from everybody because that's our talking points. That is our barking point, so we will hear that from everyone. <clears throat> All right. Here's the fucking issue of the day, right? I would refer you to the Department of Energy. Specifics. Too bad. Thank you. On Tyree Nichols. The on Tyree Nichols. In the uh, in previous police brutality cases uh, in the past couple of years, the officers uh, have been white. Uh, that's not the case. Oh, this is a right wing asshole, by the way. If you don't follow this as much as I do, this guy's a right wing asshole. Uh, in this in this case, is the president concerned that within the culture of policing, there is a comfort with violence and uh, an entitlement to use violence that would lead these officers uh, to beat a man to death for for fleeing? Uh, from them during a traffic stop? Does he feel that police 
may feel emboldened to do these things and what would he do about that? so so look, i mean the the president has called for meaningful reform. he's called on it very clearly and has spoken to it ah the last two years and he wants to see real change. he wants to make sure there is accountability with law enforcement officers. ah no you don't and ah qualifying immunity do that then. nope that's something you guys took off the table you guys took off ending qualified immunity off the table so you are not looking to keep anybody accountable that's not that's bullshit who violate their oaths and he also said that ah we need to build that long lasting relationship between enforcement and the vast majority we understand and he believes of whom were wear the badge honorably and the vast majority wear it honorably let me debunk this again if you have made it as a cop for a long period of time that means you are okay with the system as it is people who are not okay with the system like mike woods jr or fuck i mean i had family that was actually not a family of family so you know not actually blood related that were cops for a couple years and they stopped and have never gone back because they had too much empathy for their fellow humans and one of the things they do is give you a personality test to be a cop and if you have too much empathy towards your fellow man you can't be a cop so no that's bullshit there is no you have to lack empathy to be a cop fuck you that is important too and uh, in those communities uh, not only they they wear it honorably but they also uh, to serve the community uh, to to serve into the community that they want to protect uh, and that they serve the community they, that they want to protect so which community do they want to protect cuz it's another ones that they work in and so look we're we're not going to get into psych, you know doing any any uh, psychology here uh, and going into the the minds of of uh of folks but what we can say is we believe that of we folks. there needs to be meaningful reform which is why the president acted and took executive action when uh when congress could not i would just follow up on that uh, his predecessor uh, in 2017 uh, encouraged uh, police officers to uh, don't be too nice and suggested that they, they might uh, hit the heads of prisoners on the tops of their patrol cars uh, does the president have any plans to speak to police officers and say that this is kind of behavior is not acceptable? Does he uh, plan to address any police groups or anything like that? I understand the question, Andrew, but I think the president has been very clear. He's been very clear on the importance of having true reform, uh, of the importance of making sure that communities feel safe. Uh, he took action, right? He took executive action to deal with that specific specific issue, uh, and uh, and that's what he's going to continue to. He hasn't talked about this. You, you mentioned that President Biden has called for Congress to pass the George Floyd bill. For black Americans who are deeply disturbed and frustrated by 